We're in New Orleans and it's Mardi Gras season. Or are we in the Twilight Zone? Well, in this week's edition of Nightmare Fuel, we are in both as we tackle one of the most bitter and cruel scripts ever devised for the show. What Rod Serling did when he scripted the masks was unlock the door to personality traits being caricatures. Doesn't matter what walk of life you stroll, we all know of somebody who is a stereotype of something in a certain way of life. Life. You see it all the time in the media, there are many types of people that just slot into place. The frightened, the greedy, the vain, the stupid, they're the four stereotypes on display here and they are all unmasked by being masked. Jason Foster is an incredibly wealthy man, large estate, butler, stocks, bonds, assets, money, he's got everything in his life from the ground up, but on this eve, he's on his deathbed with an uncertain yet definitely short time to live. Now normally you may expect while on your deathbed to reflect on your life, drink in the best of your memories once again, console loved ones and part them with kindness and love. Jason Foster on the other hand had something far more brutal up his sleeve and that's because his loved ones are caricatures he despises. His daughter, Emily, is a huge worrier. She's a hypochondriac that can't help but panic and show concern for every tiny detail in her life, making mountains out of molehills. Her husband, Wilfred, is a tight-fisted and greedy businessman. He wants all the money and wealth in the world, however he can get it, and that is the only thing that spurs him on. Their son, Wilfred Jr., is a lumbering oaf of a man that is soft in the head and enjoys being cruel to small animals with a god complex, and Paula, their daughter, adores herself. The most beautiful sight in her life is her own reflection in a mirror, and she is constantly pampering herself up to be as glorious as possible, to the detriment of having no time or care for anybody else. When the family arrive at the house and speak to Jason, he flat out calls all of their bluffs. He knows they don't love him or care about him dying. All they care about is getting a piece of the pie he baked during his life. Jason tells them, I don't care, you can have it. The will's sorted, you'll get everything of mine, but the only catch is you have to do as I say. You each have to wear a mask until midnight. If you remove the mask at any time, you inherit nothing. You lose. Good Dear sir, you'd think this offer sounds simple, right? But as soon as the masks are handed out, the tables turn. Just look at these things. They are nothing short of grotesque, and the very image of them has cemented the masks as one of the more visually haunting episodes of The Twilight Zone. Jason informs his relatives that the masks are meant to represent the antithesis of the wearer. However, being a sarcastic bastard, he emphasizes quite clearly to the audience through the way he says, certain words that the masks reflect them entirely and not their antitheses. Emily is given the mask of a worried coward to reflect her hypochondria. Wilfred is given a mask full of misery that reflects his cold, soulless, money-driven way of life. Wilfred Jr. is given the mask of an almost primate-like clown that reflects his carelessness and brutish nature. And Paula is given a mask of a narcissist to reflect her selfishness. Jason adopts a skull mask to signify his death is en route. It's safe to say nobody feels comfortable in their masks. Having to stare at the ghastly sights for hours on end is enough to eventually make everyone beg to remove their masks before the midnight target. The incredible thing is that now we can't see the expressions of the actors beneath the masks, only their voices. Yet the way they're written and the tones of their voices gels with the expressions on the masks when Emily speaks speaks, for example, her voice is full of anxiety and panic, and her mask amplifies this. The family are very much ready to drop all of their potential gain from Jason's death, simply so that they no longer have to look at the masks. But then Jason goes into maximum overdrive. His final speech is nothing short of an onslaught, an old dying man with a weak heart propped up in a wheelchair and nothing else to utilize but his voice is capable of fully dismantling 
every single one of the others. The tirade of vengeful, venomous, belittling phrases that crumble every person to the point they cannot rebuttal it. It's as if they know deep down that what Jason says is true. Jason dies on the stroke of midnight and at long last the family can remove their masks. However, when doing so... What's the matter with you all? Now everybody is permanently scarred by the masks. They now have to carry on with their faces reminding them of the memories of this night. Jason's words about the home truths of their characters will permanently be there to haunt them. Now they will never be able to live again without being reminded of who they really are. The makeup and prosthetics on the faces of the actors here is even more nightmarish than the masks themselves. This episode remains one of the most visually striking installments of The Twilight Zone with unforgettable nightmarish imagery. That makes up just half the fuel. The other half comes from Jason Foster. He has to be one of the best characters written by Rod Serling. He literally uses his final hours alive to barrage and berate his so-called loved ones and curse them for the rest of their lives. There's some serious badass moves right there, and every word uttered by the man is explosive. The Twilight Zone has always been able to comment on the human experience in some capacity, and the flavour here is to not box yourself into a checklist. Be a person who is kind, who has time and and love for others, is able to share things with others, and doesn't put personal gain at the forefront of life. Look after yourself, but look after those around you too, or else you may also be forced to wear the mask of the person the world views you as. I'm Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, and I shall see you again when our paths cross once more in the Twilight Zone. <laughs>